Well, amen. Whoa, a little hot. Amen and good welcome. Uh, welcome to this good, nice, brisk winter morning uh, together. Uh, glad that you're here. Glad you're with us. And even to those who have not been able to come out as we've been inside, especially, just want to say welcome to you. If you're a visitor, my name's Clint, lead pastor, one of the elders. Uh, we care very much about being able to gather as the people of God and believe there's much grace in doing that. And as we have said, if there was a shot to be outside um, in relatively decent weather, which we will just say this is that, then we would be out here. And so again, if you've not been able to gather in weeks, I know I've had certain conversations just pastorally with folks uh, who've talked about the difficulty that it is spiritually to not gather together uh, with the people. And so just say to you again, welcome this morning. I want to begin this morning with just a few pretty uh, substantial, if not the most substantial questions one could ask. How good is good enough? How righteous is righteous enough? And I mean righteous enough to go to heaven when one dies. How many commandments can a person break and still have a destiny of heaven rather than a destiny of hell? Based on just personal conversations and years of ministry and just being a Christian and walking with God, it seems to me that the common answer to these questions always seems to be in response to the goodness of the person being questioned. So if I ask a person how good is good enough, that person usually says, basically, I am. The bar is somewhere just beneath me, but beneath me. I'm, I'm far enough. I've done enough. I'm righteous enough. I am good enough in my eyes compared to those whom I compare myself with. It's rare today to meet a person who would say, I don't measure up. I don't think I'm a good person. I don't think I'm good enough to go to heaven. In fact, the the attitude of the spirit of this age is a little more akin to, I better be good enough. If not, something is wrong with God, not me. That somewhat dominates the day that we live in. And so then my question is, what does authentic Christianity teach about the law of God and the righteousness required to enter the kingdom of heaven? So again, this series is authentically Christian, following King Jesus together. What does authentic Christianity teach is the the righteous requirement to enter the kingdom of heaven? And in order to answer that question, what does Christianity teach? We must ask the question, what does Christ teach? What does the Jesus whom we claim to follow claim and teach about righteousness, about the law, about what it means to be good enough to enter the kingdom of heaven? This morning we continue this series in Matthew's Gospel, and particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to see kind of the main uh, point of what Christ is going to teach us and show us in these four verses that, is that Christ Himself came to fulfill the law. Now that's why He came. He came to uphold and fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. And that those who enter the kingdom must have a righteousness that categorically surpass, surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Or to put it a little more simply, Jesus fulfills the law and reveals true righteousness. That's what we'll see in our text today. That Christ himself fulfills the law and reveals true righteousness. And therefore, if we want to have hope, to have confidence that we can enter the kingdom of heaven and enter glory, then we must look to the righteous king, Jesus himself, and, and to submit to and trust in his righteousness that we might live the life he's called us to as his disciples. So let's pray and ask for God's help. And then we'll ask and answer four questions. Father God, I pray you would teach us. Help us to view your law the way you view the law. Help us as your followers and even those who are peering in as we listen and learn from King Jesus to view the Bible the way you view the Bible. Help us to view kingdom greatness the way you view greatness. Help us to, and we pray and ask and plead to view righteousness the way you view righteousness. Christ, if we're going to be your followers, if we're going to claim to be Christians, those who follow Christ, may our answers to these questions be the answers you give to these questions, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number one, how does King Jesus view the law? How does King Jesus view the law? Look again at verse 17. Christ says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, the first thing I want you to notice before we get into what Christ himself thinks about the law and teaches about the law is notice this phrase, I have come. Christ understands himself on mission in all that he does. The Christian God is a missionary God, and Christ is the missionary par excellence. 
He is the one who left the comforts of his home and entered into this world in order to proclaim good news. Our God is a missionary God, and so he says, I have come on mission. This is who our God is. Christ displayed this missionary heart when he entered into the house of Zacchaeus, if you remember in Luke's gospel. When he says to him at the end of that account, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That Christ himself on mission is on mission in order to bring good news to save and redeem sinners. Now surely some of the people peering into this Sermon on the Mount in this moment, particularly those with skepticism, thought, what do you mean have come? You're Joseph and Mary's boy. Why are you talking like this? What do you mean you have come? Where have you come from? Who do you think you are? What kind of man is has asked in our study on, on Monday? What, who talks like this? I have come. Like, do you walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm Clint. Nice to meet you. I have come. It's like, what, what are we, like, who is it who speaks like this? Surely, again, there's skepticism. But, it, but Matthew has told us from the opening pages of his gospel account that this is the mission of Christ. This is who he is. He's a missionary God. He recorded to us what the angel said to Joseph when speaking about Mary and the one whom she was pregnant with. He said, she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Again, our God is a missionary God. But in order for Christ to accomplish this mission of saving sinners, notice what he says. I have come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Now, why would he have to say this? So it seems to me if he's going to say, I came not to abolish, that would seem to be that there are some thinking that's what he's doing. That he's at least abrogating or he's abolishing. He's coming and he's teaching with some kind of new law, some kind of new teaching, some kind of new rule that suddenly is saying, I'm abolishing the law of God in the Old Testament. Apparently, that's what some people thought Jesus and his ministry was doing, that he was a contradiction to the Old Testament. Why? Well, because they saw him gathering with fishermen and tax collectors and sinners, spending time with them. And so they assumed if you're that kind of teacher hanging out with those kind of people, you must not be doing that which us religious people seek to do. He came for the sick, not the healthy. He came for the sinner, not the perfectly righteous. He came for those who knew they had a deadly cancer called sin and that Christ is the only cure. He said as much later in Matthew's Gospel. When he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This was a shocker to the Pharisees and the scribes. It would actually lead to Jesus later being falsely accused of being a drunkard and a glutton because of the people who he spent time with. And so right now, he's prophetically correcting those who will misinterpret his actions. And he's letting you know, do not think I came to abolish the law. Negatively, I want you to make sure you don't misunderstand what it is I'm about. I did not come to abolish the law. But notice also, he says something positive. So negatively, I didn't come to abolish. Positively, he says, I came to fulfill the law. Now, what we call commonly as the Old Testament the, the first century Jews would have referred to as the Law and the Prophets. That would have been the title they used. So the Law and the Prophets. This would have included the Law of the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible. Moses wrote. It would include the Prophets, minor and major Prophets. It also would have included uh, the, the, the wisdom literature. The Proverbs and the Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And, would, and then have the re record of Israel's history. And sometimes the Old Testament even was referred to just simply as the Law. So we see that down in verse 18. So what is Jesus then saying? He's saying, I didn't come to abolish everything you know and read in the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. I'm the point of it all. Far from coming to abolish the law, he's the one who obeyed it and fulfilled it perfectly. And he's saying, he's making a staggering claim that the entirety of the Old Testament points to him. All the prophecies, all the laws were pointers. They were signposts pointing Israel to King Jesus and his coming. Paul gives a helpful illustration in Colossians saying that the ceremonial laws were a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so Jesus is teaching that all of the laws, the moral laws, the civil laws, the ceremonial laws were, were shadows pointing to the substance, namely himself. It's kind of like the jump man points to Michael Jordan. It's kind of like your profile pic pointing to you. There's a shadow in the Old Testament, but the, the, the substance of that shadow is Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
This is why Matthew throughout his gospel regularly will quote the Old Testament and this let you know this was to fulfill what was written. So over and over and over you read that and it's like, why does he quote it and why does he always remind us that? Because he's showing us that the entirety of the Old Testament is fulfilled and pointing to Christ Jesus our Lord. The Old Testament is a shadow. Christ is the substance. And what is the climax of Christ's fulfillment that he accomplished? What's the cross? He fulfilled the law of God by perfectly obeying it on our behalf and then climbing on Calvary's cross and suffering under the wrath of God, the just penalty for every lawbreaker that you ought to have for your own. Christ said, I will take it sacrificially. And I will die the death sinners deserve because I came to seek and save that which is lost. And I will raise from the grave to demonstrate I'm the Messiah who can save sinners. This is what his entire baptism was about. Do you remember what he said when John the Baptist is like, whoa, Jesus, you're tripping. I'm not, I'm not going to baptize you. You should baptize me. But Jesus responded and said, no, no, this, let it be so for now. This is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. His baptism was a picture of what he came to do. He was to be under the wrath of God and give forth the righteousness of God to all who would believe. He was to come to satisfy the law's demand that sinners must die. And so he would die in the place of sinners. In order to do what he came to do, save sinners, he must fulfill the law. Not abolish it, not set it aside. The entirety of the law and prophets were pointing to the teaching and ministry of King Jesus. The gospel was was present in the shadows of the Old Testament and prophets, but in full view in the substance of Christ. Or as Bishop Ryle says, the Old Testament is the gospel in the bud. The New Testament is the gospel in full flower. So how does King Jesus view the law? As perfectly fulfilled in Him. It all points to Him. It's all about Him. The goal of the law is Christ. He's the the telos. He's the end of the law. He's the pointer of it all. Christ is the point of the Old Testament. If you read it assuming I should be like this good person and not like this bad person, you miss the entire point of the Old Testament. The point of the Old Testament is Christ. He said, I did not come to abolish this. I came to fulfill it. This is how he views the law. The law and the prophets are the shadow. He is the substance. Second question. How does he view the Bible? How does King Jesus view the Bible? Dustin, my pastoral assistant, came to Christ a few years ago. And, uh, and I remember kind of he was just early converted. Comes to Christ. And he kind of reached out and said, hey, like, would you teach me the Bible? I know nothing about the Bible. So I've been around church, generally speaking, but I know nothing about the Bible. And I heard you in a sermon the other day, and you said something about God's will is revealed in the Bible. And then he let me know, very frankly, now I understand the Bible is written by sinful man and has their own biases in it. So I want to know which part of the Bible I can read and understand God's will. Dustin had believed that the theologically liberal teaching that the Bible contained God's word rather than was God's word. And so he assumed, I think God's word's in there somewhere, but how do I know where to find it amidst all of the errors? I told him, I said, said, I'll be happy to sit down and explain this to you, but the first place we're going to start is I want you to tell me why Jesus is wrong about how he reads his Bible. (laughs) I wish y'all could have seen how this uh, self-admittedly arrogant Davidson on his way to graduate from Davidson with a degree in bioinformatics. What his face looked like when, when I said, I want you to tell me why Jesus is wrong. It's like he had seen a ghost. And the arrogance became uh, immediate humility. I said, no, no, if you're going to say that about the Bible, that's fine. You can hold that view. You just need to know you disagree with Jesus. That you think he's wrong. And you need to come face to face with that reality. You can't call him a good teacher and say he's wrong about the very thing he teaches. And so we had this conversation. So then the question is, how does Jesus view his Bible? Verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Again, far from abolishing or abrogating the law, Jesus now points out the very value of the law. He says the law, and again, the Old Testament is precious value to the end of time until heaven and earth pass away. He's saying that all of it, the entirety of the law, and again, by that he meant the Old Testament, will be fulfilled or accomplished according to God's will. He says, not an iota, a dot. What does he mean by that? Iota, just, it's the Greek translation of a yod in Hebrew. Dustin and I are now taking Hebrew together. He's also taking Greek because he's still smart. Uh, he's just humble, submitted to the Lord's grace. He's taking both at the same time. So he's either smart or ignorant. I'm not sure which one. But amen. Praise God for him. But a yod is a mark in Hebrew. 
And so Jesus is saying, no, 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 let me tell you how I view the Old Testament scriptures. Every single jot and tittle, every single iota, every dot matters and will be fulfilled. All of it precious and holy. All of it will come to full fruition. Every single thing that God has written in his word will come to pass. For us, it might, it might, uh, the illustration might be until like every single cross T or dotted I, every bit of it will be accomplished. None of it is inconsequential. He's saying that every detail of Scripture will be fulfilled. That heaven and earth will not pass away until all that the Word says is accomplished. He's showing the eternality of His Word. The heavens and the earth, even the earth that you sit on right now, will pass away. Not so with the Word of God. It will be fulfilled perfectly in Christ. The law and the prophets point to and will be fulfilled in Christ. The Bidi Anyabwile, on a helpful sermon on this text, said, The Word is more permanent than the world's. This is how Christ viewed his Bible. This is why he believed, he knew his Bible. Everything the Bible says, everything the Word says will be accomplished. He's familiar with Isaiah 55, 10. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, maybe even today, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Jesus later in Matthew makes it clear that his word has the same authority as this word. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Do you see what Jesus has done there? This word is authoritative, law and the prophets, the Old Testament, and so is my word. My word is a fulfillment and consistent with this word. This is not two different books telling two different stories. This is the culmination of all the Old Testament is pointing forth and coming forth now in the word of Christ. God's word is eternal. It is a revelation of his very own character. It is perfectly fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. Jesus views his Bible as the very word of God down to every iota, every dot. This is why, as followers of Christ, we believe that the Bible is not merely a book, but it's the very Word of God. That it's the very Word of God. So we don't rip the Old Testament apart from the New Testament as if somehow the Old Testament is this mean God and this New Testament is this merciful God. No, it's one story of a triune God redeeming a broken world and broken man through the person and work of King Jesus. This is how we view our Bible. The law and the prophets and the wisdom literature points to him. The gospels and acts unveil him and the epistles explain him. It's all about Christ. It's either pointing to him, unveiling him, or explaining him. This is our word. This is why we believe the Bible is inerrant, infallible, and authoritative in its original manuscripts. This is why we believe this. It's inerrant. It's without error. It's infallible. It's incapable of making error. And it's authoritative. It's the final authority in the life and practice of the Christian and of the Christian church. This is the Word of God. It reveals the will of God, pointing us to Jesus, the very Son of God. If you reject any portion of the Christian Scriptures, the 66 books closed canon, then you reject the Jesus the Scriptures reveal. You disagree with Him. Now, if you study these Scriptures for mere academic reasons, just to learn about them, to be able to argue. You also miss the point. Jesus blasted the Pharisees for this very reality. John chapter 5. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Christ is real clear. This Bible is the word of God about the person and work of God through the Son of God to redeem this broken world. If you reject the scriptures, you reject the Savior. This is how Christ views his Bible. How do you view the Bible? And does your life agree with your lips? Does your life submit to this as the very word of God? Or is it a book that teaches you some good things about how to live? Does it reveal God? Is it God's authority in your life, speaking and governing your life as king? Or is it an option on the table? Third question. How does King Jesus view greatness? How does he view greatness? So now he's going to connect his fulfillment of the law and to the law's reality in the life of of the kingdom of of his followers. So he's going to say, no, no. If this is how Christ views the law, if this is how he views the scriptures which unpack and reveal the law, then this is what it looks like to be a Christian who believes that. 
This is what a follower looks like. He says, look, my kingdom is full of those who believe I'm the king and submit to my kingdom. Verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, to relax more literally just means to loosen one's grip. So it just means functionally, like if you believe Christ is king, but then you, you kind of like, well, I have the word, but I'm just kind of going to relax it a little bit. Not really. It's not going to grip your conscience. It's not going to grip your life. It's not going to lead and have authority in practice in your life. He says anyone who relaxes their grip, loosens their grip, their life, their teaching, their ministry, their hearts not submitted to my word will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, why does Christ say this? Well, it's because Jesus is about making disciples of Jesus. He's going to make followers of King Jesus. He made it clear in the Great Commission, right? What does he say in the Great Commission? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey or observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So he's correcting any misunderstandings about what does it look like to follow Christ. To follow King Jesus is not to relax the authority of Scripture. To follow King Jesus because of His grace and mercy to you is not to say, therefore, the commands of Christ don't matter to me. He says anyone who relaxes these commandments, meaning His commandments, His teaching, and His right interpretation of the law, anyone who ignores these things will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. People won't be honored in the kingdom of heaven for being rule breakers or command breakers. Abusing the grace of God with foulness is not obeying Jesus. And this might seem silly, but I I need y'all to understand. I know pastors. I have pastor friends who are characterized by, as soon as we get together, foul speech coming out of their mouth. And they do this because what they're trying to do is prove that they really believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. They're not trusting in their good works, all of which I agree with. And yet somehow when they get together, they're cursing to see if they can draw out this legalist out of me. And say, see, look, you're trusting in your righteousness. That's utter nonsense. Christ Jesus, our Lord, literally says anyone who relaxes the least of these commandments, not the greatest ones, the least of them, will be called least in the kingdom. Now notice he says there's good news, least in the kingdom. They really are Christians. They really are saved. They're just least in their effectiveness for kingdom worth and value in what they're doing for the sake of Christ. So he's showing this. He's displaying this. Greatness in the kingdom is determined in large part by obedience to the king's commands. This is what Spurgeon clearly says. The peerage of Christ's kingdom is ordered according to obedience. But again, let's be clear. This is good news. They're in. They're just least in the kingdom. The first type of people are in there just least. And notice the wordplay. Whoever relaxes the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. It's even more distinct in the original language. This wordplay is intentional. What commandments are you tempted to view as least? What teachings of Christ and Christ's interpretation of the entirety of Scripture are you tempted to say, ah, that's not a big deal. We're all sinners. We all sin a little bit. It's not a big deal. Friends, every single sin you commit is against an infinitely holy God and therefore is infinitely heinous. So it might be the least in this life in its effect and and the reaping and sowing, but it's against an infinitely holy God, therefore it's always a massive deal. You very well may be a Christian, but you make little of Jesus when you make little of His commands and therefore you're little in your kingdom effectiveness. It should be our goal as followers of Christ to live out and teach the life and teaching of Christ. Therefore, let us lean in heavy over the next few weeks as Christ is going to take this and apply it to about six different categories. He's going to talk to us about anger. He's going to talk to us about lust. He's going to talk to us about marriage. He's going to talk to us about retribution and repaying and loving your enemies. He's going to show us how important it is that we keep our word, we keep our oaths. He's going to show us, no, 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 a follower of Christ lives differently. And so we not relax these, but when we seek by God's grace and for God's glory to be faithful to the teaching of Christ. How does King Jesus view greatness in his kingdom? Obedience to him. Faithfulness. Not impact. You can't control impact. That's up to him. What you can control is, am I seeking to submit to all that God has taught me to submit to? 
Fourth question. How does King Jesus view righteousness? How does King Jesus view righteousness? Verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now up to this point, Christ has clearly showed us He's the perfect fulfillment of the law. That that He is all that the Scriptures point to and that His followers submit to His teaching, follow His teaching, do His teaching, and teach His teaching. And now he's going to address the radical reality of the righteousness required to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, when you look at verse 20, I'm going to read it to you again. This is a terrifyingly shocking verse to any and everyone who would seek to go to heaven based on any effort of their own righteousness. Terrifyingly shocking if you think you're good enough. Verse 20, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We're not talking about greatness and leastness in the kingdom anymore. We're talking about even getting in. Now let's talk about these scribes and Pharisees. This is the first time in Matthew's gospel Jesus addresses this group. They're known for their obedience to the law. They taught and sought to obey what, what they believed was 248 commandments from the law. And they sought to o- avoid what they saw as 365 prohibitions. So they put those two together, that's 613 laws that Pharisees and scribes assumed they were perfectly keeping. And Jesus is now talking to some fishermen, tax collectors, and sinners, and he says to them, as scribes and Pharisees likely are peering in, your righteousness must exceed those. What? The scribes, that's like those are the most righteous people we know. Most of these guys, a lot, plenty of these guys would have the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, memorized by the time they were five years old. Like they're working with, you know, as the young people say, they built different. (laughs) Like they're working with something different when it comes to they're proud of their own righteousness. And Jesus looks at this crowd of ordinary people and says, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you won't even get in. What is Jesus saying? Is he saying you have to obey more than them? I mean, what is it? 614 laws? 615? 915? How many is enough? How good is good enough? And how do we reconcile verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of scribes and Pharisees, with verse 3? Blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritually bankrupt, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wait a minute, Jesus, like, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't enter. Blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Theirs is the king. How do we reconcile these two things? Well, friends, you don't have to reconcile, friends. We just need to read it correctly. These two verses aren't enemies. Christ is not teaching something that's contradictory in verse 20 that he just said down in verse 3. How can spiritually bankrupt people have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees? How can we have this righteousness? Friends, if you read just through the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount, which it would be a good thing for you to do this afternoon, just read through the Sermon on the Mount. You'll see very clearly, and especially if you read through the rest of Matthew, but very clearly, Jesus is not talking about righteousness in terms of quantity, but in terms of quality. So he's not saying you need more of what they have. He's saying you need something altogether different. What they have is foul to the core. It's not you need to get more of what they have. What they have is flawed fundamentally. You need something else entirely. He's like the Pharisees aren't even playing on the right field. They're they're evaluating outward conformity while Jesus is looking at inward reality. Like they're just not in the same ballpark. It's like somebody showing up in in football football pads to a a water polo meet with the Cooper boys. (laughs) He's like, you got the wrong equipment, Doc. You're going to (laughs) drown. This situation is not going to work out. And this is what Christ is showing. The Pharisees are working with something altogether flawed. This is not going to work. They're going to drown under the wrath of God. So you you must have a righteousness that exceeds their righteousness. You have no hope of victory by looking to something similar to the thing they've been looking to. He's saying in order to enter the kingdom, you must have a righteousness that surpasses, that exceeds their righteousness. He's exposing they have the wrong kind of righteousness. And reality is no righteousness at all. You need a boat, an ark, that can save you from the water of God's just judgment on the unrighteous. Because self-righteousness, self-effort to be righteous enough will never work. James, the brother of Jesus, says in his letter, 
Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Do you see what this means? Do you see the implications? Despairing of any and all self-righteousness is the first step towards the kingdom of God. You must first despair of your own righteousness, of any effort, of anything you can do to get right with a holy and righteous God. Despairing of your own righteousness, that's the first step toward faith in Christ. And so Paul shows us, you want to know actually who's built different? It's God. God has a righteousness that is different from the righteousness of man. Romans chapter 3. The Apostle Paul shares this good news. After explaining, we're reading this with our kids at home, reading through Romans chapter at a time. We're reading Romans chapter 1, and we kind of get, Paul says, I'm unashamed of the gospel, which is the power of salvation for all who believe, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. It's like, that's good news. We want to hear about this gospel that can save any sinner. And at the end of chapter 1, it lists this list of sins, and we get through reading it. My daughter, Eden, we, we finish, and Eden's like, wow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, baby, that's intense. And it's going to, Paul's saying, no, no, this gospel is the good news that can save sinners. Chapter 2 is now going to explain Jews, sinful. Chapter 3, Gentiles, sinful. And in the midst of chapter 3, after Paul's made this argument, the gospel's good news to save sinners, both Jew and Greek. Now let me tell you how this saves Jew and Greek. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So what about the law? So, it's, so the law is bearing witness. The law is pointing. You know one of the great things of the law? It's a tutor. It's a guide. It's helping. The law shows you you're guilty. And in showing you you're guilty, it tells you, look within. You're not going to find any hope. It guides you. This is what Paul says in Galatians 3.24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The end of the law, again, the tell us of the law, the fulfillment of the law is in Christ for all who believe. And so Paul says later in Romans as he continues to unfold his argument, Romans 10.4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The law is meant to drive you to a righteousness only found through faith in Christ. He's not saying you need more of what they have, but you need something altogether different from what they have. You don't need more righteousness like them. You need the righteousness that is Him. You don't need to be more like the Pharisees. You need Christ. You have no hope outside of Christ. The Pharisees and the scribes had this superficial obedience to the letter of the law while neglecting to actually care about love for God and love for neighbor, which the whole law is meant to bring out of our hearts. So literally, they would come up with all these, kind of, all these superficial laws that they could say, check, 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 look how good I am. You aren't doing that, you're not as good as me. And so they were literally tithing off mint and dill and cumin. They're, like they were giving tithes every week off of mints. <laughs> so again, we've talked about the mint ministry and the value of the mint ministry when you're singing inside with the masks. <laughs> and so they're like, I'm going to get 10 minutes. I'm going to make sure I tie the one to the church. <laughs> like they were doing these silly, frivolous things to try to show their righteousness. But Jesus blasts them in chapter 23 saying, yet yeah, you're neglecting the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy. You don't even love God and love people and you think you're a good person. And this is what Christ is exposing in them. That they're, they're lessening the requirements of the law and increasing the exceptions. So we'll see this in a couple of weeks when we get to marriage. So it's like Jesus gives a certificate of divorce. Moses gives a certificate of divorce because of hardness of hearts. And so then suddenly these dudes are coming up with all kinds. Like if your wifey burns your food, you can divorce her. So they're making all these exceptions to the law and thinking they're righteous. And so Christ is like, no, you're not even thinking biblically. You're not even thinking about God. You should know better. The Pharisees should have known better. Our God is a God who's not looking merely at external conformity, but internal reality. I think about King David. When he's talking, the Lord says to Samuel about King David, the Lord sees not as man sees, but man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so there was this promise there's going to be a new heart, that a spirit is coming, the spirit is going to come, and man will love God from their heart. They will love his law from the heart. Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. 
So Christ is saying, you know, I'm looking at an altogether different righteousness, a righteousness that is not showing up on the outside, but I'm looking at the heart. He blasts again the, the, the pharisaical hypocrisy of the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you're like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Friend, what are you full of within? God looks at the heart. God means for His people to love His law, to love God, to love others from the heart, not just mere external conformity. These Pharisees adjust the law so they can feel good about their obedience while all the while their hearts are far from God. And friends, this is the nature of human righteousness. We stress versions of the law we feel like we can keep. Versions of the law we feel like we do a good job on so we can uh, judge others for breaking the law. So that then when somebody asks us, what's a good person like? We're the standard of measurement. And when we look down, they're bad. When we look up, they're better. But we become the standard. This is self-righteousness at its core. But King Jesus says to enter his kingdom, you've got to have this righteous heart, righteous internally, not just externally. You must be categorically somebody different from who you are and who you can make yourself to be. You must have a righteousness that you cannot find within. You must look to Christ. James Montgomery Boyce commenting on this said it well. The point is that human goodness is not good enough for God. And this means that although it will see a man through this life, often with flying colors, it will not see him to heaven. You can pile human goodness upon human goodness upon human goodness. You can refine it and perfect it and polish it. But no matter how hard you try, you fall short of God's standard because human righteousness is qualitatively different from the righteousness of God. Or as plenty have said, being a good man or a good person might keep you out of jail but it will not keep you out of hell. The righteousness God requires is a different kind of righteousness. So what Jesus is teaching is that you need the righteousness given to you freely, not based on your works. This is why in Matthew chapter 11, the Lord Jesus can say, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden from your self-righteous working, trying to get right. Come to me, all weary and heavy laden, exhausted from the burdens of your sins and trying to make yourself better. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Christ says the righteousness of God is given to you when Christ does the work and you get the rest. That He's the one who says it is finished, and by faith you trust in His finished work and you receive rest. The kind of rest is, I need not do anything to enter the kingdom of God in a righteousness on my own. I must believe in the righteousness of God in Christ, that, that righteousness came to me, and by grace through faith I trust in Christ in Christ alone. He does the work, you get the rest. It's through childlike faith we enter the kingdom of God. So again, greatness comes up in Matthew chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to him saying, Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, calling to him a child, put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Greatness in the kingdom of heaven, as our Lord teaches, is only possible For those who despair of their righteousness and with childlike humility trust in God and say, Father, you're my only hope. The Son of God is my only hope. And why is this? Well, because Jesus is the one. I don't know if you you probably didn't see this as we read through it. Maybe didn't think much about it. But why can this be the case? Why can this man speak like this? The prophets throughout the scriptures will say, thus saith the Lord. The evangelists. The epistle writers will say, it is written. But Jesus, unlike any other teacher, says, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. I say to you. He's speaking with an authority that only God can speak with because he is God. And so he can tell you the righteous requirement of the law and what it's required to enter heaven because he's God in flesh. This is the Son of God who came to save sinners by fulfilling the law and the prophets. By inviting the sick and the unrighteous, weary sinners to come and receive the healing balm of His righteousness by grace through faith in His life, death, burial, and resurrection. That's the kind of person that can talk like this. 
The only kind of person that can say the kinds of things that Jesus says is the Son of God. He requires you to be perfectly righteous. I want to conclude by trying to give you an illustration to help crystallize the joy of the good news of the righteousness of God in Christ. Let's imagine for just a moment, you're going to get real excited for a little bit here. Let's imagine for just a moment your dad is Bill Gates. Now you're going to get sad. And let's imagine you stole your dad's credit card and you ran up $743 million worth of debt. Partying, drugs, education, good things, bad things, $743 million of debt. For him to forgive you of that debt means he's going to eat the $743 million and treat you as if you had not sinned against him in that way. This is what it's like when God forgives us of our sins. A debt we could not pay treats us as if we don't owe it anymore. But it doesn't stop there. So that's, that's only half of this good news. Imagine if Bill Gates not only forgave you the $743 million debt, but he sold all that he had and he deposited $78.2 billion into your account. That's what it's like to come to Christ for righteousness. The righteousness of God in Christ not only sets you free of the debt you can never pay, but deposits in your account righteousness you could never imagine. This is the righteousness of God in Christ. You go from being in this debt you cannot pay to having a wealth of righteousness that you will, for eternity, glory in God for giving you. So how does King Jesus view righteousness? He requires perfection. Jesus Christ meets the requirement and offers himself to sinners like you, sinners like me. Friends, I assure you, this righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's all together glorious in ways the scribes and Pharisees never know. And when you enter this kingdom of heaven by grace alone, through faith alone, in the righteousness of Christ alone, then you say, I want to follow King Jesus and I want my life to do and teach what he taught me to do and teach. And I want that to happen until I see the righteous one face to face. And what a day that will be. Until then, we honor the law of Christ. We read our Bibles the way he reads his Bible. We look to Christ as the fulfillment of it all. We received and trust in His righteousness and His righteousness alone. And we live our lives by grace, submitted to His commands as we teach others to do the same. Let's close in prayer.